Hi everybody, I hope this video finds you well. In today's video, we're going to finish up our discussion of conditional analysis, which remember was our attempt to understand the relationship between two categorical variables by talking about a little interesting phenomenon called Simpson's paradox that can arise when studying uh, conditional analysis and working with categorical variables and trying to understand their relationship. As we'll see, this Simpson's paradox, which is the name it gets uh, math in mathematics, uh, is basically directly related in statistics statistics to the concept of a confounding or lurking variable, which if you remember way back when we first introduced statistical studies, we said that lurking or confounding variables were an issue when trying to establish a relationship between two variables because sometimes there is a sort of third variable that is driving or sort of changing the relationship behind the scenes. And if we don't analyze or realize that variable, we might sort of misunderstand the relationship between the two variables we're actually trying to study. So to sort of help us understand what Simpson's paradox is, now uh, and before we get to our example of this, if you haven't ever heard of the, the sort of term paradox, paradox in mathematics just means a statement that uh, while it's sort of uh, logical on the surface, once we follow it, to its logical conclusion gives us some sort of nonsensical statement or some sort of contradiction. In other words, a paradox is a logical statement that when followed to its natural conclusions comes to sort of an illogical conclusion. And a lot of times in mathematics and logic, uh, then it's up to sort of the person who's analyzing this to try to come up with some resolution for the paradox, maybe to explain why the initial assumptions are not as logical as they seem, or why the what appears to be logical flow from the paradox uh, isn't as logical as it might actually seem, something along those lines. Uh, and paradoxes are really, really interesting and lead to a lot of very sort of interesting theoretical and abstract thought. Uh, and so we're going to consider this one called Simpson's Paradox. So to help us understand this, before we sort of discuss how it applies in statistics, let's just take a look at a little example here. So we're going to suppose you're studying crime fighting in Gotham City. So you follow the two most famous crime fighters in the city and watch them each attempt to solve 200 cases. So in other words, we're talking about Batman and Robin here. So you gather the following data. So there's our data there. There's Batman and Robin, the two different crime fighters we're following. And then we basically classify every case that they attempt to, uh, to solve as either that they successfully solved it or they did not solve it. So you'll notice that Batman solved 180 of the cases he attempted uh, and failed to solve 20, whereas Robin solved 185 and failed to solve 15. Uh, this right here is uh, a two-way table. Um, we know that usually when we're looking at two-way tables, we like totals here. So the total here is 200. The total here is 200. Of course, these totals have to be 200 because we said that we watch them attempt to solve 200 cases each. So of course, the row totals are 200. We can total these up to 180 plus 185. Looks like that should be uh, 365 there, and that's 35. And then the overall total is 400 because between these two, we watch them attempt to solve 400 cases. All right, so what we're going to be interested in is we want to calculate the success rate for each crime fighter. In other words, uh, what percentage of the time uh, was each crime fighter successful at solving the case that they were working on? And we'll use that to try to determine who was more successful. So if we think about that, we can get uh, the sort of Batman success rate. Well, that would be equal to the 180 cases that he solved uh, divided by the 200 that he attempted. So 180 divided by 200 would give us a 90% success rate. So in other words, 90% of the cases that Batman attempted, he successfully solved. Uh, for Robin here, we can go ahead and take a look at that, the Robin success rate well that would be the cases that robin solved successfully 185 out of the 200 that he attempted so 185 out of 200 and if we look at that do that on our calculator we should get 92.5 percent so robin solved 92.5 percent of the cases that he attempted so in terms of who was more successful here, if we're thinking about who was more successful. Well, clearly Robin was the sort of more successful crime fighter with just a slightly higher success rate, 92.5% versus 90%. Okay, so 
we've used this data and we've made our conclusion, right? That uh, the sort of relationship here between crime fighter and success rate is that Robin is the more successful crime fighter. I mean, not by a lot, but by a little bit, 92.5 to 90%. Okay, so uh, this might seem a little surprising, right? Uh, we know that Batman is the hero and Robin is the sidekick. So maybe we might think this seems to be counterintuitive. Uh, maybe I don't know anything about crime fighting or superheroes and maybe I've just m made my data incorrectly. Who knows? But we might consider that there's maybe something else going be on behind the scenes, right? If we think about what could be an explanation, maybe the explanation is Batman simply is not as good at solving crimes as Robin, or maybe there's some th sort of third variable that we didn't analyze, at least initially, that really would explain the situation better. Well, what might that be? What might that variable be? Well, as we said, Batman is sort of the superhero and Robin is the sidekick. Maybe they take on different sorts of cases. Maybe the really challenging cases are the ones that Batman takes on and Robin gets all the easy ones. So what if we sort of reanalyzed our data with this extra variable of how difficult the different cases were? So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So now let's suppose that you look over your data. So you have these 400 some cases that you studied, some 200 that Batman worked on, Robin 200 as well. And you decide to classify each of the cases they attempted to solve as either easy or difficult. So you classified some of the cases as easy cases, some of them as difficult ones. After doing this, you get the following data. So for easy cases, we can see that Batman solved 10 and failed to solve zero whereas Robin solved 180 and did not solve 10. Whereas for difficult cases, Batman solved 170 and did not solve 20, and Robin solved five and did not solve five. Now, you might say, is this different data? Well, let's check. We can actually see that this data here really is the same as this. It's just been classified a little further. Notice that Batman solved 10 and 170, putting those together gives us his 180. He failed to solve 0 and 20, putting those together gives us his 20. So this is really the same information, just with a further classification. Same thing for Robin, 180 and 5 gives us 185, 10 and 5 gives us 15. So this information here really is the same, the data hasn't been changed, it's just been classified according to another variable. So let's do the same sort of analysis and look at the success rate in each category of case. So let's calculate the success rate for each crime fighter for easy cases and the same thing for difficult cases. So we'll get some totals here. Uh, it should be pretty clear that that's 10 and that's 190. That's 190 and that's 10. And of course, overall, there'd be 200 here. Okay, so let's see. So what would be Batman's success rate for easy? So for easy easy here. Well, he solved 10 out of the 10 that he attempted. So it would be 10 out of 10, which is a 100% success rate. What about Robin? So Robin's success rate for easy cases would be the 180 out of the 190 that he attempted. So 180 out of 190, we can do that on our calculator, 180 divided by 190 and then convert it into a percentage, looks to be about 94.7%. So Batman was 10 for 10 on easy cases and Robin was 180 out of 190. That means Batman's success was 100%, whereas Robin's was still very good, 94.7, but a little bit lower. So who was the better or more successful crime fighter for easy cases? Well, it would be Batman. He was 100% successful versus 94.7. Let's see what happens when we analyze the difficult cases. Well, if we take a look here, this would be 190, 10, I guess that would be 175, 25, and then 200 here. Okay, so let's look for the difficult cases. So the Batman success rate for difficult. Well, he solved 180 of the 190 he attempted. So it'd be 170 out of 190. If we put that into our calculator, 170 divided by 190, uh, we should get that that comes out as about 89.5%. So notice that his success rate, 89.5, is definitely lower uh, for 
difficult cases than it is for easy, drops from 100% down to 89.5%, which makes sense. I mean, if we classify these as difficult, they're probably harder to solve. Uh, let's see about for Robin, the Robin success rate for difficult cases would be five out of 10, right? Successfully solve five after attempting 10, and we can see that that's a success rate of 50%. So notice that his success rate for easy was 94.7, and there was a big drop down to 50% for difficult ones. So who is the better crime fighter for difficult cases? Well, we can see that it was Batman. 89.5% is a much better success rate than 50%. So this right here is the Simpsons paradox, because what we've just seen is that for each category of case, easy cases and difficult cases, Batman was the more successful crime fighter. Yet overall, as we saw back here, if we just look at the success rate overall and forget about the, diff the difference between easy and difficult, Robin was the more successful crime fighter. This is why it's a paradox, right? Because if we analyze it from this perspective, we seem to get that Batman is more successful, whereas if we see here, Robin seems more successful. In fact, it's even a little bit more paradoxical because we're basically saying that Batman is better in every situation, yet somehow worse overall. So what's the resolution for this paradox? What explains what's going on here? I mean, is this some massive contradiction and it invalidates everything we're doing? Well, not really. The explanation is all in how often they attempt these cases. You can see that for easy cases, Batman only attempted 10 versus Robin's 190. So Robin takes on far, far more easy cases than Batman does. And the, it's, the, the reverse is true for difficult cases. Batman took on 190 versus Robin's 10. So in other words, Batman is trying a lot more difficult cases and Robin is trying a lot more easy cases. What that means is that Batman's overall success rate, his 90%, is much closer to his success rate for difficult ones. 90 is very close to 89.5 because he tries a lot more difficult ones. Whereas Robin's success rate, 92.5, is much, much closer to his success rate for easy because he tries a lot more easy ones. It's all dependent on the situation they often find themselves in. So that's the sort of resolution here, is that basically the overall percentage weights their success rate to what type of cases they attempt more frequently. Okay, so how does this apply in sort of real life or for real life statistics? Well, first let's tie it into the idea of confounding or lurking variables. Notice that if we just had this data here, we might come to the conclusion that Robin is the superior crime fighter. The problem, though, is, is that there's this third variable, the difficulty of the cases they take on, that's sort of confounding the results. And once we use that, uh, that third variable, easy or difficult, well, then we see that we actually get a totally different relationship, a totally different conclusion, that Batman is the better crime fighter. All right, where does this also show up in everyday statistics? Well, I want to give you guys a couple examples. First, there's a famous sort of statistical case of this uh, where different uh, healthcare and sort of emergency service uh, uh, emergency services were studying data about the sort of success rate of using ambulances and using helicopters, right? There's a lot of locations where, uh, you know, maybe there's certain people in remote locations and things like that. And, you know, a lot of emergency services were investigating making use of helicopters. Now, the downside of that, of course, is that helicopters are much more expensive to maintain than ambulances. So what they did is that they did some trial runs and they did, you know, like periods of six months or so. And then they looked at the success rates. In other words, whether or not the patients, um, you know, survived or whether or not they they were sort of reached in time, given how they were sort of picked up, ambulance or helicopter. Well, they found out that the ambulances had a much higher success rate in terms of patients surviving or at least not having serious injuries, whereas the helicopters, even though they were more expensive, were not, didn't have as good of a success rate. So initially, the sort of view was, well, that means maybe these helicopters really aren't worth the money. 
The problem was, though, is that there was another underlying variable. Just like here, where you know Robin was taking on easy cases and Batman was taking on difficult cases, helicopters were being dispatched to really severe emergencies, whereas ambulances were being dispatched to some severe emergencies, but a lot of less severe emergencies. So, of course, if you just look at the pure success rate, the ambulances look better because they're generally assigned the quote-unquote easier emergencies. Another great example of that, of uh, this idea of sort of the confounding or lurking variable behind the scenes, is if you follow basketball and you look at something like field goal percentage, which is how often a player makes the shots that they attempt. If you look at like career free throw or uh, career field goal percentage, you'll see that somebody like Michael Jordan, widely considered like the best basketball player of all time, has a career field goal percentage of about 49.7%, meaning he made about 49.7 of the shots he attempted. Uh, a player that's not known uh, for their offensive abilities who played with uh, Michael Jordan was somebody like Dennis Rodman. His career field goal percentage is 52%. So does that mean that he was a better shooter, a better offensive player than Michael Jordan, who's widely considered one of the best of all time? Well, not at all, because they shot the ball in different situations. Somebody like Michael Jordan was expected to score the ball in clutch situations, under heavy uh, defense. Um, he was shooting the ball for, uh, much further away. Somebody like Dennis Rodman, who barely shot the ball at all, basically was only shooting things right next to the basket, layups, dunks, like things like that. So they were shooting in completely different situations, easy and difficult again. Of course, maybe there's easy, medium, difficult, really difficult. Who knows how you want to classify? But the point was is that just looking at the overall percentage might confuse the actual relationship behind the scenes. So I just wanted you guys to sort of think about that a little bit since this conditional analysis is a powerful tool. I mean, the idea of studying two categorical variables, seeing the relationship between them is definitely a really important thing that's done in statistics. But just like always, we have to be careful that if we limit our attention to looking at two variables, we have to always be aware that there could be other variables that are impacting the relationship, the results behind the scenes. Notice that the only way, though, that we can analyze that those other variables is by getting more data, in this case, getting that third variable with these classifications and then reanalyzing. This basically wraps up our conditional analysis. Along with correlation and regression, this means we now understand how to look at the relationships between quantitative variables as well as between categorical variables. In our next video, we'll have a big sort of change of gears and we'll be moving into the next major section of our course, which is our study of probability. We'll need probability to help us understand the rest of the statistics that we'll be doing for the term, which is where we move into inferential statistics. So this probability will be a really, really important foundational aspect of that.